Well, good morning, everybody. So back in 2013, my wife Shannon and I, we bought our first uh, brand new vehicle. And so uh, with it came a free three-month trial of Sirius XM uh, satellite radio. And so I enjoyed listening to sports talk radio, just Christian worship channels and Christian teaching ones. Um, but as we got towards the end of that trial, I got a call from a Sirius XM representative and he, he asked me, Mr. Stevenson, are you enjoying uh, the, the radio channels that we provide? And I said, yep, I am. And he said, well, that's good to know. Well, your trial will be ending next week, but if you want to pay, I think it was like $5 a month or something like that, you can uh, continue to enjoy these channels. And I said, no, thank you. Um, and he said, but if, if you don't, you won't be able to uh, continue enjoying this if you don't subscribe. I said, no, I'm good. I don't need it. And he kept pushing, and this is his job, and he said, but if you don't take advantage of it at this price, you, you will have to pay more should you change your mind later. And, and he kept pushing and pushing and pushing, and I had to keep like rejecting and rejecting and rejecting him. It kind of felt like I was breaking up with him a little, a little difficult that way. Now, as a representative of, representative of Sirius XM Radio, like he, he was passionate about what he was selling, uh, at least he seemed to be. He was kind of making it seem like I was missing the opportunity of a lifetime, but for me, I just didn't think having satellite radio was that big of a deal. I just did not share his same level of concern about having that. Now, maybe you've had somebody call you from a credit card company or somebody's called you from a phone and internet uh, provider and they're trying to get you to uh, subscribe to some sort of package or they're asking you to up your, your level with their, in your membership and they keep saying, like, this is essential for life and you won't be happy, really, if you, unless you do this and you kind of keep rejecting their offer. You just don't agree that you need it. Now, why am I talking about this? Well, here's the thing. I think sometimes as Christians, we can feel like uh, the rejected representative. And here's what I mean. In Matthew uh, 28, Jesus gives the church a mission. And, and he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. And so if if you're a disciple, this is, this is what you are called to do. Now, if you have your Bible, you can open up to Romans chapter uh, 3, and that's where we're going to be for most of this morning. And we're going to go to a verse that is familiar to most people. Verse 23. In it, Paul, he writes, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, in Romans 3.23, Paul is diagnosing the human condition. He's saying we're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And, and when we go to carry out the mission uh, that Jesus has given us, when we go to make disciples, this is often where we'll begin as we try to introduce people to the gospel, as we try to lead them to faith in Jesus. We often go to Romans 3.23, and maybe um, you, you've shared the gospel with somebody, and you're going, yes, we, we've all sinned, we've fallen short of God's uh, standards, and, and the person who's sitting across the table from you, they're kind of just like, so what? Like, what, what's your point? Or they're indifferent. They, they're going like, I don't really care. Or maybe they're going like, you actually believe what the Bible says. And, and, and as a Christian, you might be going like, didn't you just hear what I read? Like, we're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. This is, this is big news. This is important. But they just don't think it is. Like, it's kind of like how the serious XM radio representative, representative was like, life without satellite radio is no life worth living. And I was like, I just don't happen to agree. Now, many people don't seem to find the news that everyone has sinned all that important or all that concerning if you're outside of the church. Now, you, you could even be a Christian and, and you hear us say things like the Great Commission tells us we need to share the gospel with every person out there. And you're going, okay, that, that seems a little excessive. There, there was a study released in February 2019 by the Barna Research Group and this study found that 47% of Christian millennials 
agree at least somewhat that it is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will one day share the same faith. They're going like, we, we shouldn't do that. They're going, it's kind of rude or wrong. Now let's not just pick on the millennials. Let's go and, and just go broader. In 2018, a study found that 64% of Christians believe evangelism is optional. And, and so you might kind of be going, be going like this. Like, why can't we leave people alone? Like they seem to be doing fine. Now, maybe you aren't a Christian, and, and you, you hear how Christians are, are trying to share the gospel. We say we need to share it with every person, and you've wondered, you've asked, like, why are Christians so obsessed with sharing the gospel? Why are they knocking on my door? Why are they handing out, like, pieces of paper all these different places I go? Because you know what? When I think about my life, my life is good. My life is fantastic. I don't think I need to add anything that is religious. And and you kind of are asking like, what is the point? So what if we're all sinners? How does that fact impact my life? If it's a universal condition, why is this so much of a big deal to Christians? Like, why, why are they so obsessed with sharing the gospel? Now, Paul, he's making this point. The problem is sin. And when, when you read that word sin in scripture, it revolves around two Uh, major ideas. And and the first idea is that of transgression. When you you go beyond a set boundary or limit, that that is a transgression. You transgress something. So imagine you're you're playing the game of soccer. You're out on the field. There's all the lines on the edges, and those kind of mark the boundaries of, of the playing field. And so you have to keep the ball within those lines. If you kick the ball or take the ball outside of those boundaries, you are in violation of what is permitted. And so those boundaries show the area that you're allowed to play within. Now, the other idea of of sin is to miss the mark. And so if if you're playing soccer and a player aims for the goal, he's he's gone down the field, he, he goes to take the shot, and the shot goes wide, like completely misses the net. He's he's missed the mark. How many points does he get? Absolutely none, because he's missed at the thing he was aiming at. Now, missing the mark, it can also have this idea that, that you, you fail to measure up to a standard. Most university or school exams or courses, there, there is a minimum standard that you have to meet in order to get a passing grade. So we would say maybe a pass is 65%. And so if you don't get a 65 on your exam or in your course, you fail to meet that minimum standard, um, you don't pass. You, you have failed to hit the mark. And so there's this minimum level of performance expected. Anything less than that standard is considered to be failure. And so by not miss, meeting that standard, you miss the mark. Now, what we have to understand, for, for both of these concepts of sin, there, there's something that is required. That, that if you're going to transgress something, there needs to be uh, um, some boundaries, there needs to be some limits that you cross over. If you're going to miss the mark, there needs to be a, a, a target or a standard that you miss. And so to sin is this, it's to, to go beyond the boundaries that God has set out. It is to um, miss the target he's given us to aim at. And so Paul's original readers, like those who who receive this letter in Romans, when he talks about sin, they know what boundaries he's talking about that we we go beyond. They know what standard or target we miss. And they're going, well, it's defined in God's law. It's defined in the scriptures. And, And so for Paul's original readers, they would go, the law defines the standards of what was or what is and what isn't acceptable to God. Like for, for his leader or readers, the law showed what God expected of them. And so what Paul is saying in, in verse 23 essentially is this. When we compare our lives to God's law, none of us can stay in bounds. Our aim is terrible. We fail the test. We don't get a passing grade. We're all sinners. Now, for, for me to, to, like, and maybe if you're sharing the gospel with somebody or you're trying to witness to them, just to kind of go up and go like, Romans chapter 3 verse 23 tells us we're all sinners, you're probably still going to get met with a, 
so what's your point? Or I don't believe that in, in today's culture. Like the Bible, it just doesn't carry the amount of authority that it once did in our culture. But here's the thing, regardless of your view on, on scripture, I have a feeling that you agree deep down that every person is a sinner, that, that we fail to um, keep within the boundaries, that we fail to meet the standard. We, we feel this. Now, in his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis, he kind of explains it this way. He says, everyone has heard people quarreling. They say things like this. How do you like it if anyone did the same to you? That's my seat. I was there first. Leave him alone. He isn't doing you any harm. Why should you shove in first? Give me a bit of your orange. I gave you a bit of mine. Come on, you promised. People say things like that every day, educated people as well as uneducated, and children as well as grown-ups. Now, what interests me about all these remarks is that the man who makes them is not merely saying that the other man's behavior does not happen to please him. He is appealing to some kind of standard of behavior which he expects the other man to know about. It looks, in fact, very much as if both parties had in mind some kind of law or rule of fair play or decent behavior or morality or whatever you like to call it about which they really agreed. Now, if, if you have more than one kid at home uh, during this social distancing period, you, you have an idea what C.S. Lewis is talking about because it's kind of like this. Your, your kids could be sitting on the couch and one will say, give me the game controller. It's my turn to play. You've had your turn. It's not fair if you keep playing. Or maybe you're going to order food out and one kid goes, well, uh, she got to decide where we ordered from last time. It's only fair if I get to choose the restaurant this time. Now, Lewis is kind of would ask this, like, well, who told the kids about these rules? Well, he says nobody really had to. They just kind of know them. It's almost as if these rules are hardwired into us. Now, it's, it's not just children, but it's, it's every person. Pretty much every person appeals to an unspoken yet agreed upon standard of fair and right or wrong, and we feel that every person should live by this standard. Like, you don't need a Bible to tell you that, that murder is wrong. You, you feel that it is wrong. Like with what's going on in the news with um, George Floyd, like it, it's not just Christians or people who have a verse who are looking at that and going, no, that is not right. We, we know it's not right. You don't need a law that tells you it's wrong to steal. You, you know that stealing is dishonorable. We don't celebrate people who do these things. You will not find a, a culture really that celebrates murderers and liars and thieves and, and all those things, but instead the culture despises them. The culture seeks to root them out. Now, where did we get this transcendent view of morality that spans across cultures and time? Where, when did we all agree on these foundational morals that is wrong to cheat, that's wrong to steal, that's wrong to murder, and on and on we could go? Now, some people say, okay, I see where you're going with this, but let me stop you there. They would say, okay, morality, that, that is, that's a product of evolution. They, they would say it, it developed to help us survive. But here's the reality. Most of the things that we value as a culture um, don't make sense if they're really the product of survival of the fittest. Because we applaud people for doing things that, that put their lives at risk when it's for the benefit of others. When somebody lays down their life for another person, we call them a, hero, a hero. We don't call them a fool. We say that's, that's heroic. And so if morality is merely a product of evolution, we don't live that way. Like, we, we wouldn't, like, if it was a product of evolution, we'd most likely celebrate those things that increase our chances of survival, of, of kind of being dominant over other people. So we might actually celebrate things like stealing, lying, take it, taking advantage of those who are weaker. But here's the thing, even though um, that would make sense. We don't do any of those things. Like, why do we live so different than the animal kingdom that is about the survival of the fittest? It's because it's not a product of evolution. There are objective moral values that we, we don't just know. We feel that these things are wrong. We, we feel them to be true. Now, in Romans chapter 2, Paul talks about this. 
He says, some people naturally obey the Lord, the law's commands, even though they don't have the law. This proves that the conscience is like a law written in the human heart. And so what Paul's kind of saying is this, even if you've never read any Old Testament, you've never picked up the Bible in your life, a lot of the time you live like you have. Um, He's saying there's certain standards or morals that guide your life, and they actually match up a lot with what God's word says. There are boundaries or limits that you could never imagine yourself going beyond because you're going, no, those things are wrong. I would never do them. Now, here's the question. Where did they come from? Well, if there's an absolute moral law that we all live by and appeal to, which is what the evidence points to, then there must be an absolute moral law giver. And we would say this is God. And the rational explanation to all of this is that there is an absolute right and wrong in the universe that God has stitched into us, but has also provided it in his word. And so again, this is not why, this is why we don't just say things are wrong. We feel that they are wrong. Like a few years ago, I went out to, to my car one morning and I, I could tell that somebody had broken into our car overnight um, because everything from the glove box and the center console was just kind of scattered. It was unorganized. You could tell they had been like rifling through it. Now, what, what did they get? They got like enough change for a couple coffees and some Christian CDs. I'm praying that they listened to them. They, they repented. They gave their life to the Lord. Hopefully, maybe I'll find that one out in heaven. I don't know. But here's what I knew, that, that it bothered me that somebody had done that. Like, it bothered me that they had gotten into my car when I didn't know. And I didn't just go, oh, that is wrong. It it felt wrong to me. Like, when I sat in the seat, knowing that somebody had gotten into my car without our permission, they'd kind of gone beyond that boundary, that that bothered me. It, It felt wrong. And so, here's the thing. You know and feel that there are boundaries, that there are limits There are standards that humans should live by. And so here's what Paul would kind of say, is that we all fail to live up to this felt moral law and the written law. That regardless of whether it's it's your um, conscience or the Bible that informs your morality, you know that you don't keep that law flawlessly. When you do something that you you know you shouldn't have done. You, you feel guilty, whether maybe you, you lie about something, you cheat on something, and, and your conscience says, I should not have done that. It was wrong. And so you know that people fail to live up to our collective values. This is why you will lock your car at night. This is why you lock the, the doors to your house at night, because you know that people don't follow the rules, that people uh, go beyond these barriers We know people sin because we've been sinned against and we sin against others. Now, when we sin, it's not just an offense against another person, but it's also an offense against God himself. Sin is a failure to love God. It's a failure to love other people. But when we fail to love others, um, we're failing to love someone that, that God has created, someone that God loves, someone who bears God's image. And so every sin is against the character and person of God because when we sin, when we do what we know we shouldn't do or don't do what we know we should do, we're essentially saying to God, you know what, I think I know better than you do. I I think I make a better God in this area of life um, when it comes down to it. I I think I'm wiser. I'd rather sit on the throne in this part. Now, here's the thing. You might be going, okay, so what if we all sin? Like, we're all in the same boat. It can't be that bad if everybody is in this position. But Paul's going to go, no, it is bad. It's a, it's a problem. We're all in danger because of it. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, Paul says, for the wages of sin is death. Now, when, when he says death here, you might be going, well, everybody dies. Like, that's not that big of a deal. But he's talking about a death that is beyond physical death. He's talking about spiritual and relational death. He's talking about hell. And hell is a place that scripture describes as one of eternal punishment and torment. It's exclusion from the presence of God. Hell is a place that you take away the source of every good thing that you experience in life. And we'd say every good thing comes from God. And so, of course, hell is going to be bad. 
And as much as people kind of joke about hell and how they're going to go there, if, if we understood the reality of hell, nobody would choose it voluntarily. And so here's the thing. Most of us are repulsed by hell. I think most Christians are kind of repulsed by the idea of hell. We shouldn't rejoice in the idea that, that, that people will go to hell. But here's the thing. We're repulsed by it because we realize that if it's true, we know people who are there or who will be there. And, and that's, that's hard. Like that, that, that is personal. That, that touches us. But here's something we need to remember. Just because you're repelled by hell just because you're repelled by any other Christian teaching, that, that's not enough to prove that it's not real. It's not um, a, a rational argument against it. If you're repulsed by it, all that means is that you just don't happen to like it. But here's the thing. If we were honest and, and we know that God is go- good and just, that, that hell actually makes sense. There must be consequences for the evils that people commit. Like if, if, if you were watching that, that day where people are going into heaven and God just swings the gates wide open and, and people are going in and then you go like, well, Hitler just went in there and, and there goes Stalin and that guy was a rapist, that guy was a murderer, that guy molested children, you would have a problem with that. You, you would be like, God, that is not right. They don't deserve to go there. And, and so we know that, that like those people should be held to account for what they've done. And, and hell is about justice. That's what it's about. Justice for the wrongs that people have done. But just as like we, we can list all those people who've committed those atrocities, and we go, they, they don't deserve to go to heaven. The reality is, is that we've crossed those boundaries. We've failed to meet the standards ourselves, and we don't deserve heaven. But actually, we deserve hell ourselves because we are guilty And so what Paul is saying is that sin is both a universal and a terminal problem. Now, you might not like the the rules that God has has laid down in his word. You might not agree with them. You might not like the consequences. But it kind of comes down to this fact that we are living in God's creation. He is God. He is in charge. Just like you kind of have some rules within your own home about how you do things. You're like, we don't wear our shoes in the house. We, we put the toilet lid down. This is how um, we, we put the toilet paper roll on the holder. And you expect people to adhere to those rules. In the same way, this is, this is God's creation. He has a certain way he wants things done. And, and he said these are for his glory and for our good. And so the reality is, is that there are consequences for rebellion in God's creation. Now what Judaism, which is kind of informing what Paul's writing here, and many other religions would say, is that if you meticulously keep all the laws that God lays down, if you stay in the boundaries, you can keep God happy, you'll avoid hell, you'll avoid punishment. If you live up to God's standard, then you'll deserve to get into heaven. And this is kind of a common mentality that still exists today. Like if you ask most people, do you think you'll get to go to heaven or you'll go to heaven? Most people would say yes, because I've been a pretty good person. Um, and here's, here's what we hope is that our good deeds outweigh our bad ones so that when we die, we get to go to heaven. But when we, we talk about being a good person, what we are usually doing is we're comparing ourselves to another person. We're comparing ourselves maybe um, to somebody who we think is, is worse than us. We rarely compare up. And so we compare ourselves to our neighbor, our coworker, and we go, man, um, he, he drinks a lot. He swears. He cheats on his wife. He's abusive, um, never goes to church. And we compare ourselves to them. We go, man, I'm a pretty good person. I've done way more good than them. So I think I deserve to go to heaven. And we can kind of get to this point where we go, I've lived a good life, God. I've stayed in bounds for the most part. I deserve to go to heaven. But Paul says that's not how it works. In, in chapter 3, verse 20 of Romans, Paul says, For no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law, because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. And so what, what Paul is saying is, no person can ever say to God, you know what, I deserve to be welcomed into heaven because I've earned it. 
He's actually saying if you compare your life to, to God's standard as written in Scripture, you're going to find that you haven't stayed in the lines at all. It's kind of saying this, that the law simply shows us that we are spiritually bankrupt, that we come to God empty-handed. And so Paul is saying in Romans, sin is a universal problem and also a terminal one. And the bad news, or this is bad news, and if we don't grasp the seriousness of how bad this is, we will never grasp the beauty of the gospel. But the bad news of verse 23 it's set in the middle of good news. In Romans chapter 3, verse 21, Paul says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as an atoning sacrifice in his blood, received through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be righteous and declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. And so the bad news of the gospel is that you are far worse than you could have ever imagined. But the good news is that you are more loved than you could ever hope for. And so what can we do about the problem of sin? Well, there's absolutely nothing that we can do. But, but the gospel says God has done something for us. That God has intervened. That God doesn't just overlook sin and allow every person into heaven, but he justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And so in the gospel, God has done for us what we could never have done for ourselves, that Jesus lived the perfect life that you failed to live. He died the death that you deserved to die for your sin. And God's gift of grace through Jesus Christ allows us to be redeemed, that we are purchased, we are freed from the debt of our sin because God satisfied the demands of his wrath through Jesus' death on the cross in the place of sinners. And so God's righteous demands were met in Jesus' death, which means that instead of um, eternal death in hell, there's this exchange and God gives you Christ's righteousness and you get to spend eternal life with God in his presence because he sees you as righteous. And so this is what Romans is all about. Romans 1.17 is the theme verse, that the righteous will live by faith. And so by faith in Jesus, you can have a right standing before God that you would never be able to attain on your own. And so the, the, the answer to this uh, universal and terminal problem of sin is trust in Jesus. And so salvation is not found when God responds to the things we do. Salvation is found when we respond to what God has done for us through Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, Paul writes, For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast. And so Paul's saying, like, the only part we play in this whole salvation process is faith. It is believing and staking our lives and our future on what God has done for us through Jesus. It is accepting this gift of grace. And it's nothing to brag about because faith looks to what God has done and not what we have accomplished. And faith knows that God deserves the glory and the credit for our salvation. John Piper, he puts it this way, that, that God is not looking for employees. The gospel is not a help-wanted sign. It is a help available sign. And so the gospel screams that God's love and forgiveness don't depend on your performance. And so th this is why we're not ashamed of the gospel. This is why it's good news worth sharing. We would say it's actually unloving not to share this news because the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And so maybe this is the first time you, you've actually heard and understood the gospel and you're wondering, okay, what do I do with this? Well, there were some people 2,000 years ago who were in that same position. They finally understand or understood what God had done for them through Jesus Christ. And so they asked the apostle Peter, what do we do? 
And the apostle Peter, he told them, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so salvation is found when we respond to what God has done for us. And this is how we respond. It's repentance, it's baptism, it's trusting him with our lives. And then God gives us his spirit to help us become who he already sees us as in Christ. And so if you would like to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, um, we would invite you to do that. And you can contact the church and we will help you take those steps of, of repentance and baptism. Now, here's one of the things that we're, we'll be tempted to do is try to earn what God has given us. But th- this is not what grace is about. We, we don't want to ignore the gift of grace, but we don't want to try and earn it or pay God back or in any way say we deserve God's grace by our acts. But instead we receive it, we rejoice in it, we, we live it, we love it, we share it with others. And so why are we so serious about discipleship? It's because In discipleship, Jesus teaches us how to live the lives that God has intended us to live from the very beginning. One thing that we do each week here is take time to remember that our salvation and forgiveness are not any accomplishment of our own, but it's a gift that has been given to us that was accomplished by Jesus' work on the cross. And so we, we celebrate communion here each week and we, we take the bread and we take the cup and we, we are reminded that, that it was Jesus' body that was nailed to the cross, that it was Jesus' blood that was shed for our forgiveness so that God's wrath could be satisfied, that we could be made right with him. And so we remember that it's only because of Jesus' work on the cross that we have eternal life. And we don't boast in anything that we have done, but the only thing we boast in is Jesus' death and his resurrection, and that the hope that we have because of what he's done. And so if you if you have bread and and juice at home, we'd invite you to participate with us. And when Jesus was with his disciples, he he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body given for you. Eat in remembrance of me. And he took a cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Drink. Father God, we thank you for the work that Christ has done for us. God, we thank you that forgiveness is not something that depends on our own efforts, that you don't respond to our performance, but that you have given us grace and that through trust, through faith, we can respond to what you have done for us in Christ. And so, Father, I pray that we would um, receive that grace, that we would live in that grace, that we would rejoice in that grace, but that we would also share that message on because the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of others. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us in this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.